we released our anti-racism statement in June 2020, and it really called us to a commitment to direct action. And so what I, I really love what the statement said, but those words don't mean much unless we really actively work to dismantle these systems that are here. And so I feel like as a federation, we really believe strongly in turning our words into actions. And we started asking these questions. What is that deep ongoing inner work that is required of us? What is justice and what should it look like in the future? And really what does our charism call us in this moment? So leaning into those questions, we really came to the conclusion of restorative justice. Uh, this is not the first conversation with restorative justice. We know so many of you out there are doing that work, uh, but want to continue to build those connections across the Federation and continue to push ourselves to see how we can utilize this in our institutions, our congregations, our ministries, our communities, and even in our own hearts. And so our goal of this series, we kind of break it down into four simple but really asking a lot of us ways and so directly connect the restorative justice to the cssj charism we want to say from the outright that this is part of our charism it's undeniable i think anyone who's been in the charism knows that you know no distinction from our dear neighbor and so we're connecting it right from the on start we also want to learn about restorative justice principles and practices you'll hear from catholic mobilizing network from caitlin Mornow and chris ann valencourt murphy um, who will be giving kind of that overview. And we will also, we want to make restorative justice accessible to all who share the charism. We have a wide variety of people here from the charism, um, people from our universities and colleges, and we are just so excited to have everyone here. And then how do we incorporate restorative justice into our daily lives, communities and ministries? And Sister Rose McLarney will be discussing that a little bit more. And so I'm going to pass it over to Brooklyn as we open up in prayer. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you all for being here. Um, so to, to begin this, each workshop, uh, we really want to set the intention with prayer. Uh, so we'll take a moment, all, all of us, to recognize where are you? How are you coming? What brought you here? What is stirring in your heart in regards to restorative justice? And feel free to share a word or a phrase in the chat as you settle into your awareness and intention. Allowing ourselves to be open and to learn to grow alongside each other, the following prayer uh, written on the next two slides is called Litany for Those Who Aren't Ready for Healing, a prayer by Reverend Dr. Yolanda Pierce, excerpted from uh, Catholic Mobilizing Network's website. Let us not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the inquiry and the depth of the wound. Let us not rush to offer a Band-Aid when the gaping wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Let us not offer false equivalencies, therefore thereby diminishing the particular pain being felt in a particular circumstance in a particular historical moment. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of reparations and restoration or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved son. Let us not value property over people. Let us not protect material objects while human lives hang in the balance. Let us not value a false peace over a righteous peace, a righteous justice. Let us not be afraid to sit with the ugliness, the messiness, and the pain that is life and community together. Let us not offer cliches to the grieving, those whose hearts are being torn asunder. 
let us mourn black and brown men and women who those killed extrajudiciously every 28 hours. Let us lament the loss of a man dead at the hands of a police officer who described him as a demon. Let us weep at a criminal justice system which is neither impartial nor just. Let us call for the mourning men and the wailing women, those willing to rend their garments of privilege and ease and sit in the ashes of this nation's original sin. Let us be silent when we don't know what to say. Let us be humble and listen to the pain, rage, and grief pouring from the lips of our neighbors and friends. Let us decrease so that our brothers, sisters, and siblings who live on the underside of history may increase. Let us pray with our hearts open and our body firmly rooted in the ground. Let us listen to the shattering glass and let us smell the purifying fires, for it is the language of the unheard. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. Convict me for my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent. Equip me with a zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. Thank you all for joining us in setting this intention and being here. And now I'm happy to introduce our facilitator. Chrisanne Valencourt Murphy is the Executive Director of Catholic Mobilizing Network, a national Catholic organization that seeks to end the death penalty and promote restorative justice. Chrisanne has over 25 years of experience working in national level faith-based policy and advocacy. She has been quoted in sources such as the New York Times, CNN, America Magazine, Press, National Catholic Reporter, EWTN News Nightly, and the National Catholic Register. For more than a decade, Chrisanne served as the Senior Church Relations Staff at Bread for the World, a collective Christian voice urging our nation's decision makers to end hunger at home and abroad. Chrisan is co-author of Advocating for Justice, an Evangelical Vision for Transforming Systems and Structures. From 2003 to 2005, Chrisan served as the Executive Director of Witness for Peace. In the late 90s, Chrisan was an associate with the Latin America Working Group. In 1994, Chrisan served for a year in a faith-based domestic service program working alongside migrant farm workers in Woodburn, Oregon. She has a master's in theology degree from Boston College, formerly Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Chris Ann and her husband Jay reside in Washington, DC with their three children. Thank you, Chris Ann. Thank you, Brooklyn, and thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. It's so good to be with you and it's so wonderful to see all these amazing faces and the community that um, was kind of bu really bubbling over um, even as we just gathered at the very uh, initial moments of our time together. So uh, thank you for tuning in. It is good you are here. I am delighted to be with you. Every one of us is somehow directly or indirectly impacted by harm and brokenness through our relationships, our work, our ministry, and our loss. Each one of us has brokenness. Our times are plenty full of division. The topics of mass incarceration, police violence, racial reckoning, the upcoming presidential elections, one not need look very far to find sin and brokenness around us. Like you, at CMN, we believe restorative justice can be a path toward healing. It's a way of modeling Jesus's reconciling way with our lives, creating communities of inclusion and equity and civility. 
which seek to live in right relationships and adhere to the biblical command to love your neighbor, the dear neighbor. This indeed requires all of us. Father David Kelly, perhaps some of you have heard of him. He's a, a well-known restorative justice practitioner who leads the ministry um, in the south side of Chicago called the Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation. He says this about restorative justice as a Catholic, as a, as a, a priest, as someone who's ordained. He says, my faith allows me to enter the murky mess of this world and to show up and to witness to love and redemption. Restorative justice philosophy and its practices embraces this. So this is where our Catholic living and discipleship, our mission and ministry and restorative justice come together. Catholic Mobilizing Network hopes to ex ed educate Catholic communities about restorative justice. And we're absolutely delighted to collaborate with the Federation for this important restorative justice series. For those of you who don't know about Catholic mobilizing, although it sounds like from the chat, someone just came from our, one of our prayer vigils for an execution that's happening today at the federal level. We are a founding member of the Congregation of St. Joseph Mission Network. We work to end the death penalty. We pr promote restorative justice. Our relationship with the CSJs has been absolutely critical. We really would not have gotten our start 10 years ago without the CSJs. The charism influences all aspects of CMN's mission, which at heart seeks to transform the US criminal legal system from punitive to restorative. We know that some of the hard work of imagining an entirely different and new paradigm to responding to harm and violence in a different way means that we need to build capacity to engage in restorative practices. We try to do that at CMN and we hope to um, help assist in that today. We recognize all aspects of restorative justice that, that recognize or that resonate with your charism, with our charism, and even our Catholic tradition. I think, um, Kristen, when you mentioned earlier, when you sat with these questions around the racial statement that the Federation came out with, it's, it took you down a path, it's taking down, uh, us down a path of what does restorative justice have to assist us in finding answers and finding a new way. For CMN, restorative justice has been key to the identity of our organization. It's not a secondary endeavor, but rather a fully integrated core component of our mission. Every person is created in the image and likeness of God. All human life is sacred. It's often said that hurt people hurt people, but there's a joy in knowing that the converse is equally true transformed people can and will help transform brokenness. Thank you for showing up for today's webinar and for your willingness to walk this common journey. As I mentioned, just this past summer, the Federation put out that amazing statement on racism and committed itself to direct action. I commend the Federation for calling this important webinar series together and for its commitment to action and reflection. From where we sit at CMN, we recognize that racism is a part of the broken criminal legal system that we're trying to address. But we also have to recognize that as a primarily white-led organization, working within the systems of the Catholic Church that have been historically white, historically male, that we have some work to do personally and organizationally to confront white supremacy and work toward racial healing and anti-racism. Seeking real justice must include racial justice and restoring right relationships between us. I want to acknowledge that even the idea of a conversation about race can be risky 
uncomfortable and stretching. We may not have the right words. I thank you for your willingness to be here today to grapple with some of racism's tentacles, or at least the very beginning of that as we walk down this path of restorative justice and its practices. Racism impacts every aspect of our work in ministry, and we must integrate more fully the racial justice lens into all of who we are and what we do. And we know that racial justice can be addressed through restorative justice. So I have the pleasure of introducing two wonderful presenters today who will begin to paint this picture of how restorative justice will help us and can move us forward. Our first speaker is Caitlin Morneau, and I have the joy and great fortune of working alongside Caitlin at CMN. She is the Director of Restorative Justice. Um, Caitlin is responsible for our program development that increases understanding of RJ and the use of its practices. She holds a, an MA in Conflict Transformation from the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University. She authored or co-authored the preface in a book that we have um, published called Redemption and Restoration, A Catholic Perspective on Restorative Justice with Howard Zare. Um, and then she led the adaptation of that, that book into a smaller faith formation guide called Harm, Healing, and Human Dignity, A Catholic Encounter with Restorative Justice. Caitlin lives in the Washington DC area in Alexandria, Virginia with her husband and toddler and her dog. And then Sister Rose is our second speaker. She is McLarney. She is a sister of St. Joseph of Carondelet. After graduating from Avila University in Kansas City, Missouri, with a degree in nursing, she worked in healthcare in a multiple of 25 for, roles for 25 years. After serving on the congregational leadership team for eight years, she became the executive director uh, at the Center for Women in Transition in St. Louis, Missouri for 10 years and then began um, and that's where her introduction to restorative justice um, began. She created the Missouri Restorative Justice Coalition, bringing together coalitions and educational institutions for higher education working with restorative justice. Sister Rose also taught for three years at Avila University as an adjunct perfect professor. And she currently serves as a board member on the Journey to Life, a reentry program for men and women. And she's on the board of the Center for Conflict Resolution and a member of NACRJ, the Community and Restorative Justice Association. So we have two wonderful speakers. They have a lot to share. So I will just lastly say, um, at the outset, Caitlin's going to share some restorative justice philosophy and principles with you. We have two opportunities you'll see on uh, the slide here for small group breakouts, just a few moments in small groups of five, just so that we can get a sense of each other and, and do a little bit of sharing at that more intimate level. Um, and Sister Rose is going to share specifically about restorative justice and the charism. We will have time for Q&A, so if you're thinking about questions as they come up, why don't you either send them in the chat to uh, Brooklyn. She is under US Federation. She has a little asterisk in front of her name. So you can just send her directly a question, or you can write it down um, as we go along and then, um, and then unmute yourself later. But that's, what, um, that's how we'll kind of collect your questions for that Q&A uh, time. And then lastly, we wanna make sure that we leave you with some ideas about what's next, uh, not a roadmap, but some ideas for kind of taking the next step after the workshop today. So um, we'll go over some next step opportunities for you. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Caitlin. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. I'm going to echo Chris Ann. It's just so good to be with all of you. Um, so thank you, Chris Ann, 
for that introduction. Thank you, Kristen and Brooklyn for hosting us. And thank you, Sister Rose. It's just a, a joy to present this with you. So before I jump into the content, we often talk about how restorative justice is rooted in story. And so it only feels fair to share a snippet of my own, which is just to say that as a cradle Catholic who was involved with service-based ministry most of my life, I had never heard the term restorative justice until after I graduated from college. And when I learned about it, I sensed deeply in my being its alignment with the values of my faith. And I found myself shocked and honestly maddened thinking, why have I not heard about this before? And so as I learned more and engaged more, I came to understand better at some of its theological underpinnings and the many applications that restorative justice practices can offer in ministry settings. So that's what personally fuels and inspires me in this national work of education, formation, and network building among Catholics and with the wider restorative justice movement. So with that, what I hope to offer is, is just a brief introduction that in many ways only skims the surface of the, the depth of restorative justice. But hopefully, um, for those of you that this might be new to, um, it, it serves as an introduction. And for those who are familiar already, um, we can just keep the conversation going. So I first wanna start off by saying that there's no one definition of restorative justice, but this is one way that Catholic Mobilizing Network has described it, which is to say that restorative justice is a way of understanding crime and harm in terms of the people and relationships impacted rather than the law or rule that was broken. Restorative practices seek to repair harm through transformative encounter that model Jesus's reconciling way. A lived, as a lived expression of Catholic social teaching principles, restorative justice offers a framework for transforming relationships and systems that values and is grounded in human dignity, accountability, healing, and racial equity. So, um, Kristen, if you can go to the next slide. Another way to think about this description and particularly as it contrasts with our criminal legal system is in terms of the questions that it asks. And I remember when I first heard it framed that Okay, are we, are we good? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, oh, I'm muted. Okay. Um, can you all hear me now? Okay, great. So our traditional criminal legal system tends to ask three questions. What was the crime? Who's guilty? And what should their punishment be? And when, when I get to do this in a more interactive setting, I'll say, who's missing from these questions? And we acknowledge that the victim or survivor is very much missing from these questions. So is the community. So are the systems that contributed to that crime in the first place. Um, in contrast, restorative justice asks a very different set of questions, which begin with what was the harm? Who was impacted and how? And what needs to be done to make it right? I am often reaffirmed when I remember that our Catholic tradition teaches that justice the, the ultimate vision of justice is to be in right relationship with God, one another, and creation. And this is about being in right relationship with one another. So just a couple of other things to add to these questions is that, um, you know, we, we know that countless acts of racism are not classified as crime, but they are deeply, deeply harmful. And so restorative justice creates a, a space for us to unpack and, and repair um, and find healing. Additionally, when an instance of harms takes place, these questions allow us to consider the broader social and structural issues, including racism, 
that may have include that may have contributed to addressing the underlying causes of of the incident to the greatest extent possible. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so in this one, I wanted to bring in pictures of a, a few people who have been really impactful uh, and whose stories have have been really important in in my and, and our our time at Catholic Mobilizing Network. Um, but I wanted to say a little bit more about practices. We kind of, we talk about the philosophy, we talk about principles, we talk about practices. I'll come back to principles in a moment, but I want to clarify a little bit about when we say restorative practices, what do we mean? So restorative practices are particular processes that can help to guide or facilitate restorative responses to harm. In many ways, we, you know, we know that these questions, this approach is so central to who we are as, as Catholics and who we're called to be as humans, but it's so countercultural because it's not, it's often not the norm. And so practice, these practices help us to kind of build up the muscle for, for living into this call. And so when many of us hear about restorative justice, we might think of about an encounter between those directly impacted or involved in an incident of harm, sometimes called victim offender dialogue. This is certainly one way that a restorative response can take place. Um, it, it was the case for the Gromer family, and you'll see Kate Gromer pictured there. Her daughter, Anne, was killed by her fiance, Connor, and the family is together in, uh, with Connor and with a facilitator, with a lot of work in preparation, endeavored together in a restorative justice circle that helped to meet the needs of each person, each family, as well as um, impacted um, Connor's sentencing in the end. Um, but this is not the only way to engage in restorative practices. And sometimes it's not possible or, or possibly not entirely appropriate. So another foundational practice that we can turn to, especially in ministry settings, is called circle process or peacemaking circles. These are very much rooted in and informed by indigenous traditions throughout the world, including Native American traditions here in the United States. And this approach is not limited to particular instances of harm. So to paint a picture, participants are seated in a circle of chairs. Um, this is a, again, when we're in person, these are also happening virtually in creative and very innovative ways. But when we're in person, we sit together in a circle and chairs without any tables or desks between us. There may be a centerpiece that we create together that helps to keep us visually grounded in a way. And, and then we may decide to pass a talking piece to signal who the speaker is. And that talking piece moves in the order of the circle. By moving in that order, each person has the opportunity to share deeply from his or her experience and listen deeply to others without concern of interruption or need to respond to one another directly. This in itself can be deeply healing. It can, this practice can also be used in specific instances of harm, but more broadly is, is brought to spaces for community building, for prayer and reflection, and for addressing conflict or challenging topics. Increasingly, I hear stories of communities who are turning to circle process to help unpack and address racism in their own lives and communities. Um, before we move on from this slide, I just wanted to say that there are lots of creative variations on each of these. Um, and the third picture that you see is of our, um, our colleague, Phil Rosado, who's incarcerated in Philadelphia. And he has led the, the work inside that sometimes involves circle, sometimes not. And he's led work inside of prison with his, his fellow men inside just investigating these questions of restorative justice. You know, what, what impact did our actions have on others and how do we make it right? And how do we live better amongst one another and in relation to our communities? Sometimes they invite in groups from the outside to go through workshops with them. And it's, 
you know, having visited, it's a really powerful experience. So I think that's all I wanted to mention for now on the practices. Um, but if Kristen, you want to go ahead to the next slide. I promised I would come back to the principles. So sometimes it, it can be tempting in this work to focus solely on the practices themselves. And Kay Pranis, who is a very well-known author and trainer in circle process, um, reminds us, it reminds me, that they're called practices for a reason. That they, they can create a structure and a space for us to rehearse, in a sense, the ways that we aim to live in every moment of every relationship. And so it's really the undergirding principles that we aspire to embody. And Catholic Mobilizing Network has been, has been doing some work around ways that we articulate these principles, particularly from a Catholic perspective. So again, like the definition or description I offered earlier, this is, this is not the only way to describe these principles, but it's one way that we do in our work. So the first of these is that restorative justice upholds dignity. We pursue justice that upholds the value of every life, no matter the harm someone has suffered or caused. We recognize that harm and injustice violate dignity and the sanctity of all those impacted. So as we remember our shared humanity, we reaffirm the possibility of, an, of a new shared future in which all can flourish. The next is that and I, always, I love in our Catholic teaching how it talks about that dignity is not only individual but also relational. And so restorative justice and our faith calls us to do this work in relationship with one another. We pursue justice that cherishes our interconnectedness. Our faith calls us into right relationships with God, creation, and one another acknowledging our place within an interconnected web of relationships means fostering our mutual responsibility and accountability to one another. In the spirit of subsidiarity, justice should strive for collaborative and inclusive processes, encouraging the meaningful participation of those most impacted by injustice. As we've worked to develop this language, it's, it's particularly in, in this section, but throughout too, that I am so encouraged and heartened by the charism of the sisters and the emphasis on, on mutuality. Um, so thank you for, for leading us in this work. Um, next to that, it seeks healing. A restorative vision of justice seeks first to address suffering of those who are experiencing harm and victimization. This is achieved by attending to physical, emotional, material, social, and spiritual needs to the greatest extent possible. Justice then also should encourage those who fend toward acknowledgement, discernment, penance, atonement, and making amends. Justice should therefore also seek to address unhealed trauma and destructive cycles within people who cause harm so they can stand spiritually ready to engage in reparative action. We know that so many times those who cause harm were first caused themselves and this idea of a victim and an offender being separate from one another is, is really false. Um, that, that we have all both been harmed and caused harm to others at various times in our lives. And finally, a restorative approach to justice enables transformation. We pursue a justice that promotes both individual and collective healing and change. Crime and violence are fueled by brokenness within individuals, communities, and social systems. For our communities to experience safety and wholeness, we must be willing to name and address injustices of, of social inequity, systemic racism, trauma, and poverty. To do this, we must center the voices and experiences of the marginalized, those marginalized by victimization, incarceration, trauma and systemic oppression. So again, hopefully this offers just a bit of an introduction and primer um, for all of us and just to offer some common language as we 
move forward. Um, and I know Chris Ann is going to invite us into some small group time now. Thank you so much, Caitlin, um, for that bird's eye view on restorative uh, justice philosophy and practices um, and some faces and stories along the way. So thank you so much. <clears throat> so we are going into just probably seven minutes of a small group. Um, and Brooklyn has put for us on the slide the question. Um, and so I'll read it aloud. As you consider various areas of your life and your ministry, where am I taking a restorative approach or integrating restorative practices be helpful? We've got a little bit of uh, an experience of who all is with us, not just in the squares, but in a smaller group sense. So thank you for that. Um, super, well, well um, we are delighted to introduce Rose McClarney, who's gonna kind of share more about restorative justice and the charism. So Sister Rose. Rose. Sister Rose back. Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I really, really appreciated the planning of this uh, as we have shared and gotten to know one another. And we've got so many good folks um, within our lives that um, I appreciate everyone participating and being part of this. Um, I'm going to begin with. Uh, the consensus statement from the Constitution of the Sisters of St. Joseph. And um, I'm going to point out while it's up some key phrases that I see within it. Uh, and that struck me. And uh, the first one is stimulated by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in other words, be contemplative. And there has been a real movement toward that within religious uh, life and also uh, within society uh, and being receptive to God's inspirations. And another one that we have uh, used throughout the years is a sister moves toward the more. Uh, and that means changing in stance changing part of who we are as we move toward the more. Um, and then profound love of neighbor with neighbor from whom she does not separate herself. Uh, that mutuality, that being with, uh, not for others, but being with others. And working in order to achieve unity both directly and indirectly, and there are many ways of being involved. And uh, so that are some, those are some basic things uh, from our charism that give us direction and give us something to uh, hang on to and to utilize within our life. Um, Then going to look at restorative justice, the intersection of restorative justice and the charism. Um, restorative justice and our charism have a lot of synergy. Um, I was aware of this, especially as I was uh, learning about restorative justice. And it was actually like a jolt of energy. Uh, and I realized it was because of the charism and restorative justice being so basic uh, and just making so much sense. Um, and so it was a, a, an excitement uh, connected with it. And uh, that still is true 20 years later. Um, Another term for restorative justice is transformative justice, it's already been referred. And that's moving toward the more. Um, we've heard that many times. And it's, uh, 
connecting it with restorative justice uh, says even more. And um, as I have experienced restorative justice practices, that has been a part of that. I have actually seen that happening. Uh, I've been in mediations and circle processes and seen individuals transformed by what they learn, by what they hear, by new understandings. Uh, and this includes all the different parties involved in the process. Um, one example was uh, a random circle um, grouping that happened to have some members of the police department and a gang in the same circle. And they said they never would have agreed to being in the same circle, but their experience was so powerful to them that they really appreciated it and it changed them. Um, so that's part of moving toward the more. Uh, the charism propels us. Uh, it's part of our everyday life. Um, and the uh, characteristics uh, that are in common relationships uh, are key to both, has already been referenced. Uh, knowing that we're connected and seeking unity. Uh, when I realized uh, that I had a vocation to the Sisters of St. Joseph, um, I was attracted to them because they're so relational. Um, and that was within me as well. Um, inclusiveness, um, all are not only welcome, but essential. And uh, there's a lot of decision making around who participates in a restorative justice uh, process, uh, but uh, all that are appropriate are welcomed. Um, and then the non-hierarchical or the mutuality, uh, no one is more important than the other. Uh, no one has more power than the other. We're, you know, there's good power and there's bad power, and it's why we're doing what we're doing. But there are many different roles that can be played uh, within a restorative uh, approach and also within uh, our charism. And it's the role that we're playing and what the purpose of that is that's important, not the power that we have. Um, and that's something that our society really, really could use right now. Um, the care, charism and restorative justice are a way of life. Um, I am just always conscious of both as I experience different things in all different settings, uh, how it can be utilized, either informally or in a formal way. Um, I believe that religious life exists to bridge the gap between gospel values and society and church. And restorative justice has many ways of doing this. Um, and the Catholic Church is crying, uh, society and the Catholic Church are crying out for our help. Um, the Sisters of St. Joseph have always divided the city and looked at the signs of the times. And there are so many signs of the times in today's world. Um, they are literally yelling, Black Lives Matter, the environment matters, our relationships matter, unity matters. And so we have, um, uh, many ways in which we can do that as we learn more and as we move toward the more. And uh, so I hope 
that all of us will reflect on how that might be for us. Sister Rose, are we moving to a small group? I wanna make sure yes. that we're not, okay. Wonderful, well, thank you. We do have an opportunity for a second small group. We saw that it was, was painless and it happened relatively easily. Um, so the question that we have from Sister Rose and from kind of her linking the charism and restorative justice when in your life have you experienced this intersection of RJ and the charism? And what opportunities do I see in my life where I might use the integration of this charism and restorative justice? Okay, so next up, thank you for your time in the groups. And uh, I'm, um, I'm sure you had invigorating conversations and maybe you got to meet some new people. So thank you for your attention there. Um, so this is our time in the next few minutes uh, before we do at the very end the what ne what's next so that you can have a, a sense of um, a few things that you can consider going forward. Um, we have some time for some question and answer. And so while you're thinking of a question, um, or perhaps you've already written down a question on a, a piece of note paper nearby, you can put it in the chat. So you go down to the bottom of your screen and you click on the more and you, uh, you go to the chat function. You can write in your question there, send it to the US Federation, which is Brooklyn. She will receive your questions and they'll let me know um, which questions that they're filtering and kind of what the sense of some of the questions is. So I can uh, go ahead and communicate that. Um, and so while you're getting started on that front, I'm going to go ahead and start with Sister Rose and ask her a, um, a couple of questions. So Sister Rose, um, can you tell us if restorative justice is something that most of us could learn to use? And if so, how would I learn to do it? What would you offer? Sure a wide variety of restorative justice practices, and they take different skills for the different types of practices. Uh, for example, most of us have experienced circles that are very, very, very close to um, the restorative justice uh, practice of circles. You know, in our leadership roles and our processing and all of that, we have used uh, the principles of, of circles. And so some of those, uh, that's one example of where many of us already have uh, the skills for, for that. When you get into uh, some of the things like Caitlin referred to a victim offender dialogue, <clears throat> that can take um, real skills in, especially in hard listening and staying on top of it and being able to track things uh, quickly as things progress and have a sense of what's what's going on. Uh, there are uh, programs that do restorative justice training. Uh, the Center for Conflict Resolution that will be on your resource thing um, is uh, ccrkc.org. And they are now, because of COVID, are doing virtual trainings in uh, circles, in neighborhood accountability boards, and also in uh, victim offender dialogues. Uh, so that's, uh, those are options for learning to do if you really want to participate with them. Um, another example is Avila University, uh, has a course in restorative justice. Uh, there are other universities that have uh, courses in restorative justice. Um, they may not all teach the actual practice uh, for participating in the practice, but in terms of learning more about restorative justice, um, they do. 
Terrific, Sister Rose. Um, and there'll be even some other opportunities at the end um, and available to folks here online. Um, so Sister Rosa, not another question for you. So individually, how do I learn about it? And then can you just tell us a little bit about what role sisters, associates, and partners have played with regard to restorative justice? Uh, lots of folks are saying, I'm hearing about this and I want to learn more, but what have you seen um, knowing what you know about restorative justice and where some CSJs, you know, sisters and, and associates are, are involved in, in a way? Well, an example of one way that we're addressing the systems is, uh, for example, the St. Louis province helped to sponsor the creation of the Missouri Restorative Justice Coalition, um, which put in place systems across the state of Missouri implementing restorative justice. Uh, so that's a systemic way uh, that all of the sisters and associates uh, help to support that and make that happen. Um, there are sisters that have taken the trainings uh, to do actual restorative practices. Um, the neighborhood accountability boards I referred to, the victim and offender and community all come together and look at what has been the harm. What would it take to repair that harm? So they're a part of, of uh, that process as well. They volunteer and do it. They take the trainings and then they volunteer uh, and do it. Uh, some of our institutions of higher education are teaching restorative justice uh, classes, which then teach teaches, for example, uh, school systems about restorative discipline um, so that children experience that from being in schools, which hopefully is transformative of a whole generation if it really can be done with all of, this, all of the students. Um, so those that take the classes, for example, if they're in education, if they take the classes, uh, they do it. Um, the St. Teresa Academy here in Kansas City had an incident uh, that was racially motivated uh, and they uh, hired Center for Conflict Resolution to come in and do some restorative justice practices with teachers, with students involved, and even with some parents um, to help have that a healing situation uh, for all of the students. So those are just a few of the ways that uh, sisters and associates and partners have participated. That's terrific. That's really inspiring. Um, so Caitlin, maybe you could on that note, tell us a little bit about where you see other ministries and communities integrating restorative practices, um, maybe even around racial justice issues, which is you know kind of an under theme of, of this conversation today and this, the kickoff for the series. Caitlin here. Text that she was having some internet issues. So. Okay. Well, I have another. I, well, I have another question for Sister Rose. Um, what What do you see, Sister Rose? As this is from the chat. This is from what folks have been asking. What's an action plan that you could see as to spread RJ through the U.S. Church? I mean, you've just named some ways for some schools um, <laughs> and some kind of local efforts. Do you have any ideas about um, how we can share this more fully throughout the U.S. church. You talk about the church kind of crying for help. What do you see? Well, what I had to come to for myself was I can't take on the whole church. I can't think I'm going to transform the whole church. So I do it where I am. Uh, so I chose a parish um, that is open to uh, transformation and open to unity and open to um, the things we've been talking about. And um, there have been opportunities there to both utilize restorative justice practices, but also to help to educate um, the individuals. And the parish 
then did an outreach ministry to um, an apartment building that was having a lot of crime. Mm. And they did circles there so that the residents could talk among themselves what was going on, what was the harm, what would it take to repair the harm. Um, and one of the things they did was they said, we're going to have prayer services in the park right next door where there's a lot of drugs being sold. And the drug dealers disappeared after uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, so that's, that's how I approach it rather than trying to change the whole church. Understood. That's a, that's a, a community coming together. That's wonderful. Caitlin, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. So we were just, the question that I had posed to you um, was about, we're just talking about how sisters and associates and some communities can, can play um, a role very locally. And how do you see ministries and communities integrating restorative justice practices, maybe even on the area of restorative um, racial justice? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the, the example that always comes to mind for me is some of the work that's happening in Chicago. And I know that's not the only place. And I feel like in addition to um, what we said earlier, just want to acknowledge on the line, how many of you are likely also already doing this work and maybe particularly doing it in, in the realm of racial justice. Um, but one of my favorite stories is from um, two parishes in Chicago. One is inner city and primarily and historically African-American. Another is a suburban, um, largely white parish that have, um, have paired, they've been kind of sister parishes for a little while. And they've begun holding these courageous conversations on race, um, monthly circles where they come together around a meal and then endeavor upon exploring these, some of these difficult questions. And, um, and to you know, the earlier point and question around um, how do we go about doing this? I think in so many ways, these parishes were primed to do this work together because they had already been integrating the practices, particularly circle in their respective communities. Um, and so because that, that process and that space was already familiar, then they were able to come together and, and create and build spaces together that were, were, were safe and enough to have these very difficult conversations. Um, so, and then if I can riff a little bit on what I heard of the, the second question, um, and just wanting to affirm how much this is very much a grassroots movement um, and one that's taking hold across the entire country. And so at a Catholic Mobilizing Network, we are seeking to take on the church <laughs> um, in its, you know, in its widespread, um, you know, national nature, at least here, um, here in the United States to invite communities throughout the country to, to walk, walk with us as a national Catholic community and um, look within their own communities where they can engage locally. And so for us, I, I'll share a bit about our resources, but it's really been centered on broad-based education and formation, creating access to resources and opportunities for, for those trainings and experiential learnings, as well as, as reading and other forms of, of just learning both individually and as community. Um, and then network building and helping to build capacity amongst ourselves to connect with others who are engaging upon similar ministry. And, and finally, story sharing, which we know happens in profound ways in Circle uh, we're also seeing to engage Catholic media and, you know, shifting the narrative on, on this very punitive and retributive culture of uh, responses to crime and violence that we have here in this country. So those are just a few of the broad ways that, that we're seeking and to invite others into this learning and journey and way of being with one another. Um, so. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you, Sister Rose. We're at time and we want to leave you with just a couple ideas about moving forward. Um, so 
uh, take it away. I think we, we have probably 30 seconds a piece. So Caitlin, go ahead. Okay. I will be as quick as possible. At the end of October, we are thrilled to be hosting an all virtual national Catholic conference on restorative justice. You can find links on our website and as well as the ones that Kristen's putting up, I'm sure. We have just an incredible array of speakers and opportunities to connect with one another. Um, we have a number of books and resources and uh, film recommendations on our website. I implore you to check out one of which is Harm, Human, Healing, and Human Dignity, the Faith Formation Guide that Chris Ann mentioned earlier. Um, more online resources, as I mentioned, and we have a blog that is another way of story sharing stories of those who have personally been involved in restorative processes and ministry. So I encourage you to check out each of those. And of course, uh, please do in engage and, and be a part of our anti-death penalty um, resources and action opportunities as well. Over to you, Sister Rose. So I'm going to go over Sister Rose's stuff real quick. Um, and just to note, all of these resources are also available on the link that I posted. It's the Restorative Justice Workshop Series resources. It's all on there for you to find. Um, two books of suggestions from Sister Rose was Spiritual Roots of Restorative Justice by Michael Hadley and Until We Reckon by Danielle Sered. And then the Center for Conflict Resolution, which Sister Rose is on the board of, has a lot of really great virtual programs and trainings. And at the Federation, we want you to know that, reiterate again, this is a part of a series and we're already planning the next one. Um, it was a bit ambitious making four workshops all at once, but we're ready and willing to make this happen. Uh, we're super excited. We're gonna have Dr. Shannon D. Williams, who is a professor at Villanova and Sister Melinda Pellerin, who's a sister of St. Joseph in Springfield. They're gonna be speaking on racism and restorative justice in Catholic institutions on Saturday, October 10th. And that's gonna be 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, you can find the links on where to sign up on our website. It, we're gonna be really getting into racism and historical truth telling and really connecting restorative justice as to how we can move forward on racism. Uh, the set, November and December restorative justice workshops are to be announced, uh, including the speakers, but November we will be having people who, giving practical advice on how to do restorative, adjust, restorative justice and apply it to our lives. Again, we have the resources and we're also gonna be working on a guidebook that people can use in their communities and their ministries in between these sessions to keep these conversations going. Mm. Uh, we just wanna make sure that this is, not, this is not the beginning of the conversation. This is maybe not even the middle, but we also really wanna make sure this is not the end of the conversation in these workshops. And uh, just a huge thanks to uh, Catholic Mobilizing Network to Chris Ann and Caitlin. Uh, when we started this series, we knew that we, it would be unthinkable to move along without getting them connected. Mm -hmm. uh, not only are they one of our sponsored ministries, but I have had the pleasure of working with both of them when I was a death penalty reporter and actually all the way back to being a Catholic volunteer network person. And so I've just had the pleasure of working with them for many years at this point. And they're really at the forefront of the national conversation around the death penalty and restorative justice. There's just nobody else doing the work out there like them. So please check out their resources. Super thankful for them and their support. And Sister Rose uh, was the first person I met in my death penalty reporting days. Um, and I was lucky enough to go to Journey for New Life and have dinner with her and the residents, and I'm extremely lucky to have her and call her a friend, and we can't thank her enough either for being a part of this, so thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. So we have a closing prayer, right? We have a closing prayer. Oh, great. We do, yes. Um, so just to, to end as we began and, and reconnect and ground ourselves in what we've learned, uh, taking a breath, um, thinking about how are we going to activate restorative justice in our lives and in our communities, in our work. Um, and as you take a breath in a moment, if, if you feel called to share your idea in the chat, 
as a way to ground and, and motivate and activate that action. So I will, these are prayers taken from that all may be won by the Association of Colleges of Sisters of St. Joseph uh, book. Uh, the Federation uh, statement, Federation from the Sisters of St. Joseph statement on racism that we have referenced throughout um, and from Catholic mobilizing network. So in bold is our consensus statement and we'll speak that together. Although you all are muted, we will hear our voices together. Oh God, help us to undertake everything with great desire, but remain hidden in carrying it out. Teach us to be instruments of unity and reconciliation for every kind of neighbor. Fill us with a zeal that is contagious and that multiplies all people to be witnesses. Push us to be bold and creative, ready to risk going off the beaten path, yet realistic at all times, never neglecting common sense. Let nothing stop us in works of mercy, and may we do all these things in humility and simplicity. And together we say, stimulated by the Holy Spirit of love and receptive to those inspirations, we move always toward profound love of God and love of neighbor without distinction. The resilience and well-being of humanity depends on us dismantling these systemic, structural, and cultural realities of white supremacy, endemic to the fabric of our country. We commit ourselves to the creation of the one sacred community where all people are treated as the sacred creation that they are. Racism denies the most profound truth that all of us are created in God's image and each of us is entitled to dignity and respect. As women, religious, and their partners in mission, we acknowledge our own complicity in institutional racism. We pray for our nation's healing, yet we know that that is not enough. We ask forgiveness of people of color without expecting or requiring it to move into action. It is time for bold, decisive action it is long past time to dismantle white privilege and rededicate ourselves to building God's beloved community. And together we say, stimulated by the Holy Spirit of love and receptive to those inspirations, we move always towards profound love of God and love of neighbor without distinction. And so we go forward now, knowing that the violence stops with us. Bless us, O oh compassionate one, and give us strength for the journey. Fill us with that amazing grace which breaks down walls of hatred and fear and allows your love and mercy to enter in, that the process of healing and reconciliation might begin. Finally, we, we say, stimulated by the Holy Spirit of love and receptive to those inspirations, we move always towards profound love of God and neighbor without distinction. Thank you. It's so good to be with you. There's some contact information here. Um, just thank you for your time and your attention and we'll look forward to seeing you on October 10th. Mm -hmm.